The past holds many secrets, and we're here to uncover them. Join us on this epic historical journey. Music playing. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Ancient Architects. In a previous video, I talked about a theory proposed by Professor Ivan Watkins. He suggested that ancient civilizations could cut stone by harnessing the power of the sun. Many people, myself included, don't believe that simple tools were enough to build some of the incredible ancient stone monuments we see all over the world, from Machu Picchu in South America to the Giza Plateau in Egypt. Some theories strongly suggest that ancient aliens were responsible, but I've never seen any solid evidence to back that up. Sure, ancient texts, images, and structures can be interpreted in many ways, but I believe there was a far more advanced civilization that collapsed at the end of the last ice age, and its remnants are scattered around the globe. One thing's for sure, some ancient sites clearly show highly advanced stoneworking techniques, but I don't think it was due to electricity or power tools. Instead, I believe they used more efficient methods that harnessed natural forces, like sunlight, wind, water, or sound. This kind of technology wasn't written down in history, but if they were using natural forces, there wouldn't be much physical evidence left in the archaeological record, except for the end results, like those perfectly drilled granite vases and stone walls where every block fits flawlessly. You can't work with stone the same way you do with wood or metal, especially not with hard stones like granite or diorite. These rocks are made of tightly interlocked minerals that wear down tools before you can make any real progress. Even the ancient stone and metal tools were told were used would have had almost no effect on such hard rocks. So, archaeology is clearly missing something. Even today, cutting hard stone requires diamond-tipped tools and lots of cooling fluid. It's a slow, difficult process, which brings us to another theory, using sound. Tuning forks, vibrations, sonic drilling and acoustic levitation. The idea is that sound could have been used as a kind of ancient tech. And scientifically it's possible, not just with modern tools, but maybe even with ancient materials. So how does sonic drilling actually work? Put simply, when sound vibrations at a specific frequency are transmitted through a drill bit, or even something as simple as a metal tube, it can vibrate in a way that acts like a high-frequency jackhammer. The bit hardly even needs to spin. The vibrations do the work. Compared to traditional drilling, this method is faster, wears down the tools less, and uses less energy. It's even possible to turn the handle of a large tuning fork into a cutting rod. Whether it's a metal tube or a solid drill bit, even a copper pipe, it could be used to cut granite using this method. To make a tuning fork into a sound drill, the cutting rod needs to match the resonant frequency of the fork. Here's how it works. The sideways, transverse vibrations from the prongs of the tuning fork move the U-shaped bottom part up and down, sending long, continuous waves through the cutting rod. These vibrations create a standing wave. With the strongest vibrations at both ends, and a still point, node, in the middle, where you could attach a handle. For example, a fork that's 30 centimeters long and 3 centimeters thick can produce a resonant frequency of 1100 hertz. You'd need a cutting rod about 1.5 meters long to work properly, like what's shown here. Notice the size of the rod compared to the fork. It almost looks like a trident or even a spear. And if the prongs are sharpened, it could even be used like a drill or a weapon. In Egyptian mythology, the falcon god Horus is associated with spears. But maybe the clearest evidence of sonic drilling has been staring us in the face for thousands of years. One common object seen repeatedly in ancient Egyptian art is the Waz scepter. It shows up in carvings and hieroglyphs related to Egyptian religion. It's a long, straight staff with a forked end. The other end is often stylized, sometimes resembling the head of an animal. But what if this wasn't just symbolic? The Waz scepter was a symbol of power and authority. And while it has many mythological and symbolic meanings, maybe its true function has been forgotten over time, and it was actually a real tool for cutting stone. The family history of ancient Egypt. What we thought was a symbol of power might have literally been a tool of power. Mainstream historians and archaeologists claim that traditional stone and metal tools were used to carve and shape large stone blocks and decorations. This belief mainly comes from artistic depictions of stonework found in war reliefs from Egypt's 5th dynasty all the way through to the 26th. 
But when we look closely at carved granite, it's clear that these tools couldn't have made the types of holes and cavities we see, especially not the deep circular indentations in granite where the edges are grooved in a way that suggests a hollow metal tube was used. Here's the problem. Cutting granite efficiently with just a hollow metal tube and manual labor, the way we're told it was done, isn't really possible. Without a continuous flow of water during cutting, you wouldn't be able to clear out the dust and debris. That buildup would actually prevent the drill from making progress. But you can cut granite effectively and quickly using a hollow metal tube, if you're using sonic drilling methods. In ancient Egyptian art, we see depictions of simple hand tools used to make vases and stone bowls. But realistically, even with sand as an abrasive, these simple tools couldn't have efficiently shaped hard stones like granite or diorite. And they certainly couldn't have created the clean tool marks or straight lines we see inside many Egyptian artifacts. Interestingly, the most advanced and difficult stonework, often carved from the hardest stones, comes from Egypt's Old Kingdom, even before the Fifth Dynasty. In fact, some of it dates back to pre-dynastic times. There's no question that the simpler stonework we see after the Fifth Dynasty could have been made using basic tools, since they often used softer rocks like limestone and sandstone. The earliest known depiction of a stone drill is a hieroglyph called U-24, first recorded in Gardner's sign list in 1957. It was seen in a tomb from the Third Dynasty, but it's possible that what we're actually looking at is a tuning fork tool, not a typical handheld drill as we've been told. Some researchers believe they've found ancient Egyptian carvings that show two tuning forks connected with wires on a statue of Isis and Anubis. That kind of setup could allow the forks to vibrate at a specific frequency for long periods, cutting stone without needing to strike anything with a hammer. Interestingly, there's an email archived on keelynet.com from back in 1997. It describes how an American woman allegedly broke into a storage room in an Egyptian museum and found hundreds of what she called resonance forks. These devices ranged from 8 inches to 8 or 9 feet in length. She said they looked a bit like old wooden catapults, except they had a wire stretched tightly between the two prongs of the U-shaped forks. She insisted these tools were definitely not made of iron, but of steel. The forks had U-shaped bodies and handles that resembled pitchforks. When the wire was connected, they would vibrate for a surprisingly long time. She wondered whether these tools could have had hard tool heads attached to their bottoms, allowing them to cut or engrave stone once they were tuned to the right vibration frequency. Of course, we can't verify this email or whether the discovery really happened, but it's definitely fascinating, especially since the statue of Isis and Anubis does show those forks with wires. There's also a Sumerian cylinder seal showing a musical scene where someone is clearly holding a tuning fork, this challenges the idea that tuning forks are a recent invention, possibly dating back as far as the 18th century. I believe this technology is far older. Whatever the truth may be, independent researchers have proven you can drill into hard rock using copper tubes and sound-based methods. And as we study more ancient stone sites around the world, we're learning that acoustics were widely understood by ancient civilizations. It's clear that sound was taken into account in the construction of stone structures. This new field of research is called archaeoacoustics, and we see its effects at places like Stonehenge in England, Adam's Calendar in South Africa, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and of course the Great Pyramid in Egypt. All of these sites share undeniable acoustic properties. They can amplify sound waves, causing tools to resonate at a steady frequency, which might explain how such advanced stone-cutting methods were possible, even though historians still don't fully understand them. Thanks for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. Please subscribe to explore more forgotten history with us. Like, comment, and support our journey as we uncover the truth behind ancient mysteries. See you on the next adventure.